Hello, everybody. Um, and um, too many of your humbling words. Um, I consider myself uh, a normal, a regular human being. I always say I bleed when I'm cut. <clears throat> And I have a disclaimer, I do not belong to the elite group of surgeons who never have complications and never have failures. Uh, I do have them. Um, I simply try to learn from them. And this brings me to the topic of uh, today's talk. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's a pleasure. It's an honor. Aortic valve repair, let's take ourselves back. Um, and I apologize, I, I tried to follow the previous lectures, uh, not, to, not to duplicate too much. Uh, I did not catch everything because uh, I was uh, hosting a few guests during my vacation. Um, if we treat, um, or if we treat the aortic valve, we do it either for aneurysm or for regurgitation or for a combination of both. And we need to keep in mind that uh, both root and cusp pathology contribute to aortic regurgitation. Aortic repair is not really new. The first attempts were done in the 50s, published by Dwight Harkins group. And then there were further pioneering attempts by Carlos Duran and Toby Cosgrove. Um, they had initially good results. Aortic repair gained more popularity with the operations designed by th these three colleagues, um, Bob Freiter, Sinotubular Junction Remodeling, Tyrone David, of course, and Magdi Yacoub, we all know them. Uh, and um, Tyrone and Magdi designed operations specifically made for the enlarged roots. The general assumption behind these operations was that aortic regurgitation was mainly due to aortic dilatation and by normalizing aortic dimensions, um, normal aortic valve geometry and function should be achieved. In other words, one size fits all if you choose the right operation. And if the result is not a good one, you've chosen the wrong operation. Um, at that time, and that's the common denominator uh, of, of these pioneering series, the, the main goal was that uh, all cusp margins should be at equal height for competent bell function and cooptation height should be high enough for a secure diastolic function. This is also how I started when I embarked on aortic valve repair and actually one of my first operations was a David operation after I saw Tyrone uh, do these operations 30 years ago. Let us come back to this cooptation height should be high enough for secure diastolic function. Only in the last 15 years, some surgeons have been a little more specific. And you've probably heard the concept of praying hands as the appearance of a normal aortic valve. How high is high enough? How to pray? And there are different ways of praying. So uh, I initially, as I said, started the same way as the other surgeons also. I started re-implantation in Hanover. And when these, the group in Hanover published the uh, early results of the first 100, I contributed 30 of these they found that there was a correlation between valve configuration and, and valve durability. They contributed that only to the level at which the valve was reimplanted within the graft. And I do not really agree. After all, I contributed a few failures and I reoperated them, even though I still for some years did not understand the mechanism of regurgitation. It was, it was only a few years later when I reviewed our early experience with preservation of the bicuspid valve that I realized that there was something funny about valve configuration. So I had some patients, four out of the first 60 some, that I had to reoperate within the first two to three years because of uh, regurgitation. 
and all four had had valve preserving aortic replacement and all four had this abnormal valve function that simply looked funny. I went back to the initial operation and actually they had left the operating room with that funny configuration. These failures made me review, do my homework, review what was known. Of course, there is the study by Swanson and Clark, Circulation Research, 1974. They came up with this complex set of numbers that a normal aortic valve should have. I simply thought that this was for me too complex to use it in the operating room. So again, based on the failures, which had an abnormally low height difference between the diastolic, between the free margins of the cusp and the annular plane in diastole, I hypothesized that this height difference, which we call the effective height, could be used as a configuration parameter. This is something that a surgeon can measure in the operating room if he has a caliper to go for it. This can be determined by echocardiography. And once we had the parameter, we decide to calibrate it. <coughs> so we did a study on 130 some volunteers, different age groups. Most of them were adults. And we realized that in a normally functioning aortic valve, this effective height was nine to 10 millimeters. Later studies confirmed that. And in relation to cusp uh, size or geometric height, we realized that it should be roughly 45% of geometric height. <coughs> Again, we were not the only ones. Let me show you this, uh, this table taken from a publication uh, from out of Brussels. They did not call it effective height, they called it distance from tips to annulus. And the first version of the paper, I was one of the anonymous reviewers, simply said co-optation height is important. I then asked the authors to go back and look at this parameter. And as you can see here, actually they were a little on the low side. If they had an effective height of seven millimeters, at least within short to midterm follow-up, valve function was okay. <laughs> If effective height was even lower, they had a relevant proportion of failing aortic valves. Now, when I first proposed um, to use effective height, it was also clear that this must be related to cusp height. Cusp height, for instance, being reduced in retraction, in uh, um, in retracting valve disease. Um, this valve pathology, this cusp pathology had been shown to be associated with uh, decreased durability by the Brussels group. I tried to reproduce the data and then realized that actually we did not have any data, any cutoff to base this on. So we went back to do our homework. In a prospective clinical uh, study, we studied geometric height in bicuspid and tricuspid valves. That is height in, in the center of the cusp from the nadir to the free margin in a stretched version. And in the bicuspid, and this is important in order not to be mixed up, we mainly measured the non-fused cusp. As you can see here, we found the uh, distribution of geometric heights. Um, in tricuspid valve, the mean geometric height was 20 to 21 millimeters. In bicuspids, it was actually 24. And to come back to the previous presentation, we arbitrarily defined then 20 millimeters for the non-fused cusp in a bicuspid valve or 17 millimeters in a tricuspid valve as the minimum that we would want to have in order to achieve a functioning valve. So if we look at the aortic valve in, in a different way, and this is taken from computer simulation studies done by Gilles Meron in Tel Aviv, 
uh, if you have a low geometric height, you will have limited co-optation. The same, however, will also occur if you have annular dilatation or if you have sinotubular dilatation. In other words, there is a complex interplay between root and cusp uh, geometry that determines aortic valve form and thus function. Sinotubular junction is important, virtual basal ring or the annulus, the functional annulus is important. The geometric height is important and the effective height is nothing but a simple and reproducible configuration parameter that allows us to assess the complex structure. Um, there is a, a different way of looking at the aortic valve, and I'm sure you're all um, familiar with this classification, which is frequently quoted. I do not use it very often, actually, I rarely use it, because in my mind it has relevant limitations. Number one, it's purely echocardiographic. It does not directly relate to morphology or pathology. It does not, for the same reason, provide morphologic cutoffs for decision-making that the surgeon has to do. More important, it's insensitive in defining cusp prolapse in the presence of marked aortic dilatation. In other words, if the cusp is stretched and the root is dilated, cusp prolapse may evade preoperative studies. And the type three does not differentiate between restriction to, due to aortic dilatation and restriction due to cusp retraction. So let us come back to, that, to these limitations. Valve preserving aortic replacement, sinotubular junction will be reduced and this will lead to a reduction of effective height simply because you bring the two commissures closer together and the center of the cusp margin will hang down through. So in other words, reduction of root dimensions, that is intercommissural distance, may induce or will induce uh, or unmask prolapse. In other terms, in, if the root is dilated, if we reduce sinotubular junction, or if we interfere with sinotubular junction as part of the operation, we must check effective height after restoration of root dimensions. How frequent is that? I went back, and, and these results are accepted in heart, I went back into um, 600, over 650 root aneurysms, primarily to see the frequency of cusp alterations. As you can see here, and this, these cusp dimensions were determined after, cusp, uh, after root replacement. Of course, there were some reasons why we replaced the aortic valve. In the vast majority, roughly 90%, we could preserve it. However, in 85% of instances, we found prolapse after we had reduced uh, aortic dimensions. So to have normal cusps at the end of a valve preserving root replacement is actually an exception and not the rule. Let me show you what the surgeon can do in the operating room to assess that. This is a tricuspid valve um, with severe AR and normal root dimensions. The surgical assessment is quite simple. We measure geometric height on all three cusps. It's 20 millimeters and thus normal. There is not much annular dilatation. And now we go into measuring effective height. It's nine millimeters on the left. It's seven millimeters on the non and it's close to zero on the right. So with this simple measurement, we can come up with a diagnosis of marked right cusp and mild non-coronary cusp prolapse. The same, of course, we ideally do by echocardiography. First, determining um, uh, the aortic dimensions. And you're all familiar with that. However, if you do this in a long axis view, 
you have to consider that there may be projection artifacts because you're simply off center. For this reason, we have um, made it routine to double check these measurements by going into a 3D data set with multi um, planar reconstruction. And as you can see here, all of a sudden, the root diameter of uh, an annular diameter of 3.4 will turn into a, a sinus diameter of 3.2 will turn into a sinus diameter of 3.6 centimeters. This has implications because beyond a sinus diameter of 40 to 43, 45 millimeters, root replacement is probably warranted in order to achieve a competent aortic valve. So this is important for the patient who comes to the operating room for AI. Annular diameter, we need to measure for the reasons I showed you. Again, we may have projection artifacts if measured in long axis view, and they may be artifacts due to the elliptical shape. Again, if we go into a 3D data set, multiplanar reconstruction, the annulus will increase, in this case, same patient from 3.2 to 3.4 centimeters. The mechanism of regurgitation is important, and jet eccentricity is an established indicator of cusp pathology. However, a jet may be due to prolapse or retraction. And the jet you see in the echo image may either be due to prolapse of the right cusp or retraction of the non-coronary. Can we differentiate between the two? Well, first, the differentiation is important. Prolapse, in general, is a very good substrate for repair. As you can see here, and this is as yet unpublished, all isolated tricuspid aortic valves, normal roots, the majority of the cusps with prolapse can be repaired. Whereas in the majority of instances with retraction, probably replacement is the better choice. Prolapse can easily be corrected, like with these plicating sutures but which reduce the amount of tissue redundancy and stepwise rebuild a normal cusp dimension. Again, can we do that in a systematic uh, fashion like the surgeon does it in the operating room? Let me show you this 2D example of geometric height determination um, and in a bicuspid, always of the non fused cusp, you can see in 2D, we here have a geometric height of 19 millimeters. If we apply the same in this bicuspid valve in a 3D data set with MPR, all of a sudden we have a geometric height of 2.6 centimeters. And for this bicuspid valve, means uh, this means that we have um, a substrate which is very likely to be uh, to result in a good repair result. We can also quantify prolapse by measuring effective height. Again, we can do it by 2D, but this will result in artifacts because we have to, we have to do it in an echo plane that is orthogonal to the respective cusp. The same patient, the same valve here, once measured five millimeters in 2D, will be eight millimeters in a 3D data set, and thus almost normal. There is something special about the bicuspid valve, which makes up uh, roughly 40% of valve preservation in our experience. And here we learned from mistakes or failures of the past. As expected and already shown, an effective height of less than nine millimeters, indicating that we left bicuspid prolapse, symmetric prolapse behind, was associated with a poor durability. And this was mainly the case 
in patients with isolated aortic valve repair, where we simply had an, a durability inferior to those where we did aortic replacement in addition. In these patients, annular dilatation here with a 29 millimeter cutoff, which is probably too large, resulted in absolutely unacceptable, uh, unacceptable durability. And we also found that commissural orientation played an important role. Symmetric bicuspid valves giving us excellent long-term durability. The uh, asymmetric bicuspid valves faring much poorer. What can the surgeon do about that? Uh, annuloplasty has been mentioned, and rather than trying to implant a ring either externally or externally, we have chosen the way of a suture annuloplasty in order to better accommodate the different muscle extension into the sinus that we see, particularly in bicuspid valves. And as you can see here, the addition of an annuloplasty largely eliminated the failure rate uh, after bicuspid uh, repair. More importantly, we try to bring more systematics uh, into the um, commissural orientation of bicuspid valves. And this is from a essentially double center study, uh, Brussels and Homburg, where we looked at the type of symmetry. The symmetric bicuspid valves arbitrarily determined as 160 to 180 degrees found in roughly 40%, another 40% with asymmetric bicuspid valves, and then 20% the very asymmetric bicuspid valves. They usually have partial fusion and often are mistaken as tricuspid on echocardiography. Can we do something about the symmetry of a valve? Yes. Of course, we can do root replacement, like in, in the cases uh, that were shown in the previous uh, presentation. If the root is not enlarged, I find root prophylactic root replacement overly aggressive. And my idea was if we simply eliminate part of the circumference in the fused sinus by plicating the sinus, we should be able to improve the symmetry we actually could improve the symmetry. And by doing that and adding an annuloplasty, we could find that even in this high risk group, we could achieve excellent durability. Not only that, not freedom from AI and reoperation was improved, but also systolic valve function with lower gradients if we achieved a more symmetric results. The key question now is how can we most easily or most reproducibly determine commissural orientation? And I've seen a number of presentations where at first sight, I was not absolutely certain I would agree with the determination. The key is determining the center of the root in order to be able to then determine the commissures and the angle. That's easy. That's what measure, modern echocardiography machines can do in the operating room. There are different ways of approximating this, um, this bicuspid root. We used an ellipse, we used a circle. And with the help of my uh, oldest son, who is an engineer, we finally decided that the easiest was simply to take to draw a line from the center of the non-fuse to the center of the fuse sinus, cut it by half, and this would show us in, in a very reproducible way the center of the root and allow us for more reproducible determination of commissural angle. The therapeutic consequence is clear. If we have a symmetric bicuspid valve, we simply keep it symmetric. If we have an asymmetric, we make it symmetric. The challenge is the very asymmetric bicuspid valves where we can either treat it as a tricuspid valve or we have to improvise. 
The consequences are relatively clear. And this is from a paper that we published recently in JAMA Cardiology. More than 1,000 patients with bicuspid repair. Without addressing these anatomical details, there was continuous attrition uh, of valve function, which could be largely eliminated um, by addressing these anatomical features. The good side is if we choose this geometric approach, which was based on the analysis of failures, we can preserve the aortic valve in the vast majority of patients with root aneurysms, whether the valve is tricuspid or bicuspid. One of the more recent findings, and this came from a paper where we analyzed isolated tricuspid aortic valve repair, the fact that we used it, the measurement of effective height intraoperatively was a predictor not only of better valve durability, but also of better survival. Let me summarize. Aortic valve form is like a function can be mathematically described as a function of cusp and root uh, geometry. And we need to keep in mind that valve preserving surgery is only one form of aortic valve repair. There are others, and we simply have to address the individual pathologic components. Systematic analysis and correction is clear, it's logical, and also is logical that adequate valve configuration translates into durability. Practically speaking, the most important is to rule out retraction as a poor substrate for repair. And this is where geometric height has been very helpful. And in normalizing cusp configuration, the measurement of effective height has been uh, very reproducible and is increasingly adopted by different groups around the planet. Specific valve configurations may occur and we need to keep that in mind uh, if we um, try and, and come up with a tailored approach. <clears throat> My suggestion, and, and this goes more to surgeons than, than cardiologists or cardiac anesthetists, we should also report more details of the analysis of these valve geometric, uh, of valve geometry in order to make our findings reproducible. Thank you for your attention.